Forbes Field, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, September 10th, 1942. It's the Negro League World Series. Game 2, ninth inning. The Kansas City Monarchs versus the Washington Homestead Grays, with the Monarchs leading 8-4. Satchel Page is on the mound for the Monarchs, and the Grays have a man on base. Now, a conventional pitcher would try to end this quickly, but no one could ever call this legendary fastballer conventional. Page intentionally walks the next two batters, loading the bases, meaning the next batter could be the Grays' winning run. This is a move that defies logic, considering the next batter is Josh Gibson, a devastating hitter with a record that rivals any player of the era, including Babe Ruth. Now off the field, Page and Gibson are the best of friends. But here, they're opposing warriors and living legends. And the way Page sees it, the crowd has come to see the best go up against the best. So that's what they're going to give them. And here's the pitch. Hoo-hoo, strike one. Thanks so much to Curiosity Stream for supporting our discussions of important historical stories. While there are more modest accounts of what happened between Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson that day, one thing rings true. They were both linchpins of the Negro Baseball League, an organization that existed because of, and in spite of, the racist segregation that defined the first half of 20th century America. Baseball itself started in the late 19th century as an amateur sport popularized by the Civil War when men of all colors formed teams and played. Unfortunately, like with many things that met at the intersection of money and entertainment, racism strangled that early culture. The National Association of Baseball Players voted to exclude any club with a single black player in 1867, four years before the sport went professional. And amateur teams like the Cincinnati Red Stockings adhered to this so-called gentleman's agreement to exclude black players as well. Meaning black men, many of them sons of sharecroppers who had played the game since childhood, found themselves without meaningful opportunities in the sport. And any time a black man did manage to sneak across the color barrier, they were met with harsh resistance. Eventually, they formed their own teams, with the Cuban Giants being the first on record in 1885. And as more teams arose, two centers, Chicago and the Philadelphia New York Axis, became the league's major hubs. Then in 1920, a player named Rube Foster founded the Negro National League. Considered by many to be the czar of black baseball, he nurtured it until his untimely death in 1930. Then left leaderless, the league fell apart under the weight of the Great Depression. A similar fate befell the Eastern Colored League, which was established in 1923, and it too was defunct by 1928. Now, these fallen leagues triggered an influx of players to the Negro Southern League, which limped along via exhibition tours often referred to as barnstorming due to their speed of going place to place. But then in 1932, a black business owner named Gus Greenlee resuscitated the Negro National League, which reformed in 1937 as the renamed Negro American League. And in a stroke of marketing genius, Greenlee established an East-West All-Star Game in 1933, where, get this, fans could pick the players for their team's starting lineup. Yeah, a real-life fantasy draft. It became the biggest event in black baseball, surpassing the Negro World Series in its popularity. But despite the popularity, the Monarchs, Grays, and pretty much every other Negro League team that ever existed all played against the backdrop of uncertainty. Life on the road could be harsh at the time, but alongside tedious, unair-conditioned bus trips and poor food, they also experienced deep racism. They'd sometimes show up for a game and be greeted by a Klan rally. And while touring in areas with no black-owned hotels, they'd sometimes go days without showering. And of course, any meal that they ate was either served in the back of an establishment or, more often than not, eaten on the team bus. Though on the other hand, black-owned hotels or local homeowners would often welcome the players with glee, feeding them the best food they could muster. And during the off-season, they'd be invited to play in Cuba and Mexico, which were free of segregation, and where locals treated the players with respect. So life in the Negro Leagues meant taking the good with the bad. This was the world that these players navigated, and where men like pitcher Satchel Paige and heavy hitter Josh Gibson managed to thrive. By some accounts, Josh Gibson's lifetime average was .384, the best in Negro League history, and officially, he hit 238 pitches, though some say that true number is somewhere between 800 and 1,000. As for Paige, who did actually strike out Gibson in that Negro World Series we opened this episode with, his numbers were as tremendous as his longevity. Page was born in 1906 and played his first official game as a semi-professional in 1924 as a Mobile Tiger, before going pro as one of the Chattanooga Black Lookouts in 1926. 
Ever a showman, Page would often insist that his teammates retire to the dugout or have a seat in the infield while he would strike out all three batters up for the inning. And for those of you unfamiliar with the sport, let's just say that's mighty impressive. In fact, since Page, Gibson, and many other players in the Negro Leagues were such moneymakers, soon there were men eager to integrate them into the White League. But because the first commissioner of baseball was a straight-up racist, they couldn't accomplish that until he passed away. But when that happened, Brooklyn Dodgers owner Branch Rickey began scouting black players. The question was, who would be the first black man drafted to a white team? Would it be Page, or would it be Gibson? Neither, it turns out. In a move that perplexed many, including Page and Gibson, Rickey picked Monarchs rookie Jackie Robinson to break baseball's color barrier. The reasoning had less to do with performance on the field and more about who they were as men. Despite his monster hitting, Gibson had begun to exhibit erratic behavior and had taken up with the wife of a mobster. And Page's showboating on the mound, along with the fact that Page knew his worth, were seen as negatives. So, Robinson it was. Not only did Robinson come at a lower price than Page, but as a younger man who'd served in the military, Robinson was considered more malleable. And they also thought he was more likely to silently shoulder the death threats, name-calling, and other indignities that would come with breaking baseball's color barrier. Plus, since Robinson was engaged to a black woman, Ricky believed that would quell white fears that Robinson might use his newfound glory to pursue white women. So Robinson was signed in the autumn of 1945. Sadly, predictions about the pressures that would be leveled against Robinson quickly became true. Robinson was called names at bat, and at times refused admission into hotels the rest of his white teammates were staying at. Despite all this, he played well. After spending a controversial 1946 season with a Dodgers minor league affiliate in segregated Florida, he went on to play nine years with the Dodgers. And despite the hate targeted at him, he left a legacy that opened doors for countless black baseball legends and helped to birth America's civil rights movement. With the National League now opening the doors, the American Baseball League followed suit three months later by signing Newark Eagles second baseman Larry Doby to the Cleveland Indians. Many believed Josh Gibson would have landed somewhere too, but sadly he died of a brain tumor shortly after Robinson's signing. Satchel Paige joined Doby on the Indians in 1948, becoming at 42 the oldest rookie ever signed. His pitching played a large part in the Indians winning the pennant in 1948, but no longer in his prime. Paige also suffered considerable ups and downs, as did the entire Negro League. Losing their best players to the majors, and along with that, their audience, the league sputtered along before finally being shut down in 1960. And while Negro League superstars helped usher in an era of baseball that included African-American greats like Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Reggie Jackson, and Derek Jeter, most of the league's progenitors disappeared into obscurity. Though conciliation came to a handful of players in their twilight years, as they were formally inducted into a major league team in 2008. But more significantly, Major League Baseball retroactively accepted the statistical records for all 3,400 Negro League players into their official records, bestowing Major League status upon them, though mostly posthumously. Even today, and even in a pandemic, Major League Baseball pulls in billions of dollars. And that most definitely wouldn't have been the case if the Negro League hadn't boosted fandom and fostered pride in the sport that would go on to become America's pastime. And baseball fans the world over owe these players a debt of gratitude for their willingness to endure the racism of the era and for their deep personal sacrifices, all for a sport that they loved at a time when it didn't love them back. Hey everyone, IRL Matt here. Yes, I do exist in the space of a human being. Uh, and I just wanted to thank you so much for watching today's episode and also to thank Curiosity Stream for believing in us telling historic tales. If you're watching this channel, you are probably a little like me. You love learning new things, but you also kind of want to be a little entertained while you do it, which is why I absolutely adore the Nebula Curiosity Stream Bundle. They are two places I go every week for my content on the internet, and a subscription to both services costs less than my weekly coffee habit. And no, that is not me saying that I drink too much coffee. That is me saying this is a pretty dang good deal. By using Nebula, you are helping out us and a ton of our other favorite educational content creators on the internet, such as Lady Knight the Brave, Low Spec Gamer, Legal Eagle, just to name a few, build a place on the internet where we're kind of a little bit more free to try out new and exciting stuff that might not work with YouTube's algorithm. 
all while enjoying ad-free videos and exclusive Nebula Originals. We've done a few in the past that I'm super proud of, and we actually have a few future projects coming out I can't say much on. However, one does rhyme with Cod Past, so take from that what you will. Then on the Curiosity Stream side of the equation, you get access to thousands of big budget nonfiction videos and award-winning original series all across their online learning platform. One of them that I just watched that was pretty cool was called Castle Siege Defense. Because so much of the content on this channel actually does deal with castle battles on a macro level, I wanted to learn a little more about exactly how these fortified residences kept their denizens safe. For instance, in the 12th century, many castle architects opted for round towers. I did not know why that was. Turns out it's not just because it looks cool, it's actually because projectiles will ricochet off them easier, which I thought was pretty neat. So now you might be asking yourself, how can you, dear viewer, get both of these great services for less than Matt's totally normal and not planted caffeine addiction? Well, you can start by going to curiositystream.com slash extra credits, and you'll receive a year's worth of both Nebula and CuriosityStream for the discounted price of $14.97, which is 26% off the regular price. And when you do, not only will you be supporting extra credits, but you'll also be supporting Zoe and I's totally normal caffeine habit. This bit didn't work out, did it? That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons.